Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the official Dutch premiere of Israelism. My name is Joanna, my pronouns are she, her, and I am super excited to see your full house for this um, wonderful screening uh, of Israelism. Please make sure that your telephone is on mute or off. The movie has a duration of an hour and a half, and afterwards we'll have a Q&A with the co-producers, and then um, a small panel with local Jewish um, organizations and collectives. Before we start, I would like to welcome to the stage Jonathan, who was instrumental in coordinating this screening, who will um, give you a few words about the intention of this screening. Thank you so much. Welcome to Park House and enjoy the movie. Jonathan. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I just want to make it short because there's a lot going on tonight with the filmmakers. We have not one but two filmmakers here tonight, and we also have yeah, representatives of groups that have need to be heard. Uh, but I just want to give a short rundown. I mean, this whole thing started from reading an article in the Arts about a few months ago saying about this movie that has been banned in all the campuses in the United States. And it's a movie made by Jews about Judaism and Zionism, and a lot of Jewish organizations are angry. So I said, I have to see this movie. Um, managed to get hold of it, and I said, now I have to do a screening. Uh, and lo and behold, after so many months, um, we get the screening, and we also get the filmmakers, so it's hurrah. Um, And that being said, by the way, I was born in Israel, and I come from a Jewish family, and I'm also a filmmaker, so I can also see the complexities as a filmmaker, how difficult it was to make this kind of movie. It's a very complex subject, uh, it can be divisive, but it can also connect people. Um, so it's a very important movie, I feel, to be heard, especially in these days. And I'm very um, grateful for the filmmakers that were gracious enough to split their time tonight with these very important organizations from uh, Jewish background, Israeli background, who are all against what Israel is doing right now in Palestine. Because it's very important that these voices will be heard, especially at this time in history where these voices are intentionally being delegitimized and forbidden from actually voicing themselves as if there's only one Jewish narrative, only one Israeli narrative. There are many different voices about what's going on, and the voices that you'll hear tonight that are also depicted in the movie, and the censorship that happens to these people also happens in the Netherlands. Because this movie is very focused on the United States, but it's happening everywhere. And that's why I thought, okay, I want to bring groups that I had the pleasure of working with in the Netherlands that have all been a beacon to amplify this voice against what Israel is doing in Palestine. So with that being said, uh, enjoy the evening and enjoy the film. Thank you. people displaced from their homes. At least 400 villages undone in their entirety. The colonization is also ongoing. Light is returning Even though this is the darkest night All right, uh, thank you so much everybody for, um, for being here. Uh, for those of you who just arrived, welcome. 
Uh, we're going to start um, this lovely Q&A with, uh, you, you are both producers and directors. Am I getting this correctly? I, I'm director and director of photography and Aaron's director and producer, okay. yes. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so I think we can start with, um, what was your biggest motivation for, for making this movie? I know you've, you've heard this question many times. Uh, but what was your what, what were your goals? Um, how how did this start? Totally, and thank you all so much for being here tonight. Thank you to the amazing organizations and to this amazing venue. Uh, yeah, so this is our story uh, in many ways. Uh, this is my story, uh, and it's certainly the story of many of my closest friends and loved ones. Uh, I grew up in a very small Jewish community, um, but for my bar bat mitzvah, I was given a bunch of kind of pro-Israel novels. My family has many connections to Israel, especially through marriage, but it was really kind of reading kind of Israeli novels um, that really kind of made me fall in love with the pro-Israel story. As someone who grew up in a very small Jewish community, I was made fun of for being Jewish. I did face some anti-Semitism. Um, and Israel, the story of Israel, made me feel like I was connected to something much larger than myself. And how the pro-Israel story was told to me was incredibly inspiring and incredibly empowering. It talked about redefinition and taking back one's destiny and redefining oneself. And it really made me proud to be Jewish. Like many of the characters in the film, Israel is really what made me feel connected to Judaism as a young person. Um, and then very luckily though, um, I had a teacher in high school um, who knew me and knew my family and knew how progressive my family was and was always very surprised by how pro-Israel I was. And so my senior year of high school, you could do an independent study at my public, random public high school where you study whatever you want a whole year. And, and this teacher ran it. And so I was gonna study the history of Israel that year. And you made a documentary at the end of it. I was gonna make a very pro-Israel, obviously, documentary. And so again, after talking with him for the first month of the course, you know, he asked me at one point, he said, you know, do you know anything about Palestinian history? And when I began to really think about that, I realized that I didn't. Um, because the books that I was reading and the narratives that I was told, um, and in much of the pro-Israel world, doesn't really mention Palestinians at all. There's essentially no room for Palestinian history and the Palestinian story in the Zionist pro-Israel narrative. And over the course of this year, he gave me all these books by both incredible Palestinian historians like, like Rashid Khalidi and Edward Said, as well as actually, even more importantly, many left-wing Israeli historians. And hearing Israeli historians especially talk openly about the Nakba and the occupation, and do so as proud Jews who were simply looking at their history honestly, um, made me realize that there was an entire part of the story that had been withheld from me. And it made me realize that, again, the traditional pro-Israel narrative was very similar to the traditional pro-American narrative that I grew up with uh, in my public school. Um, there was Native American massacres mile, only a couple miles from my house, but there's essentially no discussion of Native Americans in American education, or very little. Um, Native Americans are essentially viewed as an obstacle, and that's about it. And I began to realize, too, that to the Israeli narrative, Palestinians were only an obstacle and very little else. And I began to be horrified by that. Um, and over time, as I began to read more and more about Palestinian history, again, I, I realized that the ways in which Israel had oppressed the Palestinians was profound. And that though, of course, we Jews have been through unimaginable, unimaginable trauma, um, that does not justify creating unimaginable trauma for another people. Um, and when I got to college, Sam and I went to the same college together. We met many people who had had much more intense pro-Israel education than we had. Sam and I didn't go to Jewish day school. I went to Hebrew school. Um, but we met many, many, many kids um, like Simone and Eitan who had gone to Jewish day school for whom Israel really was the center or a center of their Jewish identity since birth. And they came to college really thinking that to be a good Jewish person, to live out their Jewish values, they had to fight for Israel and defend Israel. But they had never met Palestinians. And we saw what happened over and over and over and over and over again as you know, young Jewish students just met Palestinians or had classes with Palestinian professors or saw films or read books by Palestinians. And they too began to realize that the story that they had told was not the full story and totally erased the Palestinian narrative. And so it was pretty wild. Within about five years, almost all the pro-Israel student leaders on our campus were doing pro-Palestinian human rights work. Um, and within 10 years, all of them were. For five years, most of them were. 10 years, all of them were. Um, even the most extreme, incredibly racist pro-Israel students that, that, that came to college. And so realizing that all these people were transforming made us realize that our story was part of this incredibly common 
generational story happening as millions of American Jews began to realize that to really live out our Jewish values to the best of our ability, we had to fight for Palestinian rights, and that we actually see echoes of the trauma that we've been through now being placed upon Palestinians. And although you know, groups we, that we show in the film like AIPAC try to make it seem like we are a tiny proportion, that we're fringe, polling shows that we are actually incredibly common. Polling in America before October 7th, from a few years ago, that's cited widely on the right and the left, shows that for younger Jews, Jews under 40 in America, about 40% think Israel is an apartheid state, right? Is practicing the crime of apartheid. 25% of all American Jews, independent of age, believe that. And again, in this moment right now, when large organizations, American Jewish organizations, are literally saying, calling for a ceasefire is anti-Semitic, 50% of American Jews right now want a ceasefire. Polling shows only about 30% of American Jews want the war to continue. So we begin to realize that even though the larger institutions made us seem like we were a tiny proportion of the community, we were actually a massive proportion of the community and likely a majority of younger Jews. If 40% think Israel's an apartheid state, I do think we're likely at the point where 50% realize something is deeply wrong. And again, we are just as Jewish as anybody else. We simply are seeing what's being done to the Palestinians and it is unjustifiable. There is no justification for how Israel's treated the Palestinians. So that's kind of what made us want to make this film. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Come on, yeah, a round of applause. Um, I, I mean, you covered so many things in the movie, uh, beyond occupation and learning Zionism, international solidarity, intersectional solidarity. But now what, what you were talking about is, is, is very interesting because it's also very obvious in the movie that the, the levels of indoctrination really vary within American society. Um, how, how, when we talk about unlearning Zionism, um, you see your movie as also part of this ecosystem that is bringing up to light the injustices and um, the need for Palestinian solidarity. How has the reaction been so far? Because the timing of your movie was also, I think, very symbolic. It came out roughly before October 7th. Yeah, it, 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 our first screening was a little over a year ago, but we were pretty low profile just doing film festivals for the first few months. So when October 7th happened, we had just started um, a fall screening tour with like 60 college campus, mostly mm -hmm. college campus screenings. Okay. Yeah. And how, how were those initial screenings in the college campuses? Yeah, so the screenings have been great. Um, people have shown up from a wide range of perspective, students, and we welcome everyone and we welcome all questions and all perspectives, you know, Jewish students, Palestinian students, Zionist, anti-Zionist, and, um, and the screenings have been really great, really civil, really nice, um, foster dialogue, conversation. But after, especially, this was starting to happen before October 7th, but especially afterwards, we started discovering that there were a, a huge campaign being waged online to cancel our screenings um, on college campuses and using this very inflammatory rhetoric saying that the film uh, promotes anti-Semitism and is putting Jewish students in danger on campus, you know, even when most uh, professors and, and organizations bringing us to campus were actually Jewish. Right. Um, but, you know, the, according to this form letter that was sent tens of thousands of times to college presidents, um, you know, the film uh, promotes people who chant kill the Jews and all sorts of totally uh, insane claims. Um, so we started getting like, uh, some college administrators started to express concern and some even did actually try to cancel screenings, but no one successfully canceled any of them once they were announced. Like, wow. um, and, and it ended up getting, ended up creating a ton of media coverage and ultimately making the film much more of a phenomenon, I would say, than it, um, yeah. than it otherwise would have been, which is, which is really interesting. I mean, the censorship, I mean, I'm glad that you managed to screen it, but I also feel like college campuses, also here in, in the Netherlands, are being a, a hot spot to, to instrumentalize anti-Semitism. Maybe you've heard we feel unsafe um, with this particular screening or we feel unsafe with this particular teaching. We've definitely heard that as well, which is quite ironic, of course, because universities are supposed to be this beacon of um, intellectual development and really questioning your own privileges and stances. Um, how uh, do, do you see a shift happening and, and people are more receptive and, and that resistance is less or how do you? 
It's a great question. Yeah. yeah, and you know, people have said that to us hundreds of times at this point. Um, we're actually, we haven't been sued yet, um, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're part of two pretty large lawsuits in the US where uh, right-wing students are suing major universities claiming that they're anti-Semitic and using the fact that they screened our film as evidence in their lawsuits. Um, and it's very weird because at the two universities, it's Harvard and University of Pennsylvania, it was Jewish and Israeli um, students uh, or faculty who brought us to campus. And at both cases, at one of them, it was an entirely Jewish panel. At the other, it was three quarters Jewish. And literally half the panelists had served in the Israeli military. And it's like, you're really calling that anti-Semitism? And what the student said was that, again, the panels made him feel uncomfortable. It's like, yes, that is the point. That right. is exactly the point. Being uncomfortable is very different than being unsafe. Yes, yes. Right. Our film tells an incredibly common story that many Jews go through. And again, it's an uncomfortable story. As Simone, the main character, often talks about, when you learn about the occupation for the first time, it is unbelievably uncomfortable to realize that, again, many of your family members or your loved ones are either directly part of a system of literal apartheid or are supporting that is incredibly shocking and uncomfortable. But you know what's even more uncomfortable is the occupation for Palestinians. So again, when people say something makes me uncomfortable, it's like, do you have any idea what it's actually like to live under a military occupation? As Simone said, you know, there was a scene at UC Berkeley um, where Simone went to college and one of the students says, you know, how can, we, how can divestment be hostile when we're talking about a literal military occupation, right? To compare those two things, being uncomfortable as a college student versus literally living under a military occupation where you live under military law is crazy. Um, and so again, you know, again, we, we Jewish people have been through unimaginable suffering at the hands of Europeans primarily, obviously. Um, and now, and to weaponize our historic trauma to support bigotry or to support the oppression of another, of another people is deeply Orwellian and it's deeply tragic. Um, and that's what we're trying to fight against significantly. Yeah, and, and something that, for, and the UC Berkeley scene, I find incredibly symbolic because, I mean, Simone, who's not here today, shows incredible vulnerability by, by um, being transparent into how also she was being indoctrinated and very much um, incentivized to, to go out there and defend Israel. Um, how, how, because I think this is also a big part of the Zionist project to send its emissaries out there to spread the truth about, about Israel. Um, and we see also that um, the Hasbara especially, this is a growing trend to keep fighting initiatives like your film, uh, protests that are happening uh, right now all over the world in solidarity. Um, and I wanted to ask because you put out a cultural object out there. You're not starting a movement. You you're not you know. So how how do you feel about the response that it's been getting? Is it being satisfactory? Is it um, different than what you imagined? Um, how how do you feel about it? I mean, it's definitely become a bigger phenomenon than we had imagined. Um, partially because of the very tragic timing. Um, you know, want to recognize that there are uh, there is starvation and there is genocide happening in Gaza right now, um, and we are all living um, in the shadow of that every day. Um, but uh, I would say the, the the response to the film has been incredible, and it's been incredible to have um, a tool to use in this moment and to let organizers uh, use in this moment um, to uh, you know help promote organizations like the organizations that, that brought us here together for this screening um, and similar progressive Jewish organizations um, all, all around the world. Because um, that's what we always wanted this film to be was a, a, an organizing tool. And so it's, it's great to see that being used in that way. And it's really cool, I think, to show people who aren't in these organizations that, again, you can be Jewish, you can be incredibly Jewish, and that by supporting Palestinian rights, you're not losing your Jewishness in any way. And in fact, we're doing this because we're Jewish, because of our history of oppression and the way that we're horrified by the fact that our own people are now doing such horrendous things to other people. And I think the other major thing that we want our film to do is to show non-Jews, um, both Palestinians and non-Palestinians, that again, that we're here, we're, we're listening, we're trying, and that also to support Palestinian rights does not make you anti-Semitic, period. 
Um, again, anybody can be anti-Semitic. Anybody can support Jewish conspiracy theories that exaggerate Jewish power. We see it all across the globe, on the right and on the left. Anti-Semitism exists. It's a part of Western civilization, tragically. Um, so anybody can be anti-Semitic, but supporting Palestinian rights has nothing to do with anti-Semitism inherently. And also, again, there's been anti-Zionist Jews the entire time. Zionism actually was not a majority movement in the Jewish community for a very long time. So also showing that it's very normal what we're doing and that this is a very common story. Yeah, I think people are really not aware that before Zionism becoming this like mainstream Jewish identity, there were a lot of other things, like for example, Bundism. And f f I mean, I'm, I'm an organizer and I just recently found out about it. It's just so deeply buried in there um, as if the, the moral plight of being solidary is completely removed from Jewish identity, which is why I absolutely loved how you ended it with a rabbi. Um, clearly stating that us being solidary with others that are experiencing genocide is not something that will dehumanize you. In fact, what will dehumanize you, this, I mean, this phenomenon of soul loss, seeing, for example, Jewish symbols um, used in, in, in occupation and, and, you know, the, I mean, I, I cannot even think about Purim pictures that came out recently. Um, it's very tragic to experience that soul loss as a peoples, as, as Jewish people, diaspora or otherwise. Um, shall we take a few questions from the audience? Yes. Do we have some? I Can I see, if you have a question, put your arm up so that we just have an overview of how many we have in the room. Okay. Uh, do we have somebody from Parkhouse to do the mics? Are we doing this? You know what? Uh, we'll just take, um, can I see the hands again? If you could line up here, like, <laughs> that would be great. We're doing this gorilla style. So I, we'll take six of them. So it's, um, I will prioritize women, non-binary people, people of color, fat people, disabled people. You know the drill. If you're a white man, today is, is not about you. I'll get a mic. I'll get a mic. Yeah, so three at a time? Yeah, let's do that. So we'll just do three questions at a time and then um, they will answer if that's okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for all for this uh, great evening. Um, I have actually two questions. Um, first of all, I want to ask if, do you, if as Jews you see a switch in uh, the society that we live in these days. And the second question is, how do you deal with the gaslighting? Because me as a Muslim, I deal with it my whole life. I'm a generation after 9-11, so we grew up in a hell, especially in Holland, very Zionist country. Um, how do you deal with that? And I hope I could learn something from you because I'm a very, very conscious African woman and I know we didn't have a, a Holocaust in a Muslim country where I came from or any Muslim country, but we had it in the West. Still, we get the blame for it that we Muslims are anti-Semitic. Well, I'm Semitic as well, but I don't know. So I, have, can, I can learn something from you. So the Those gaslighting. Yeah, that's First it. First one, you can just pass it to the person behind you and take your seat. We'll take two other questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Noor, I'm Palestinian from Gaza. Uh, I have only one question. Uh, were you at all successful in show, showcasing this movie in Israel? Or is that part of your goals? Because obviously that would be the most impactful place to showcase this movie. Thank you. Thank you so much. You can just pass it to the person behind you. 1910, South Africa was founded. 1912, ANC was founded. I was uh, a member of the anti uh, ANC support group in Wageningen. 75 years later, celebrating that anniversary, asking a minister of the ANC, how, how, 75 years you're struggling. No one of us, the whole support group, all the people who participated had an idea that five years later, Mandela would be president. Can we get to your question, please? We are now 76 years after 8048. Uh, Please, no, history can really be Okay, amazing. great, we're gonna go to the next question. Thank you so much, next. We'll take another one, yeah, and pass on this one. Sure, I'm yes. Rajarshi, um, I grew up in India, um, so really anti-Semitism was uh, not something that uh, my country is associated with at all. Um, I think 
what is really challenging for me, um, especially uh, after watching the movie, but also reading so much about it, is uh, how little is actually being done uh, in form of uh, what can be done. So just to give you an example, um, when I was studying in the UK, we managed to successfully evict uh, the British Army from UCL campus because uh, that was fresh from the time when British Army did uh, the horrendous things in Iraq war. And uh, Tony Blair obviously became history, but uh, uh, the army would still come and recruit out on our campus, and it was very uncomfortable for our uh, Arab and Muslim uh, colleagues. Yeah. So we managed to do that. But I don't see anything that concrete happening on American campuses. I don't know. Yeah, so Gaslighting, have you been successful showing this in Israel and um, what is being done on American camp campus to curb this wave of indoctrination? Sure, um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with the gaslighting question because this is really important. I think, um, <laughs> how have we dealt with the gaslighting? I think it, the, the, the an our answer may not apply because we are white Jewish people, so it, it is easier for us to, I mean, I think in some ways, us speaking out and the fact that we get criticized as anti-Semitic or promoting anti-Semitism in some ways exposes the ridiculousness of the when the charge is, is leveled against uh, anyone criticizing Israel because, you know, when you have um, Jewish filmmakers who made a film about um, Jewish stories and were called anti-Semitic, that is inherently ridiculous. Um, when you have, uh, you know, a, the Jewish director of a film about the Holocaust is called uh, anti-Semitic and promoting Jew hatred and promoting Hamas, it sounds ridiculous. You have uh, Israeli filmmaker Yuval Abraham at Berlin Ali called anti-Semitic by the Germans. I mean, ridiculous. Um, so I think, um, I hope that us speaking out helps um, delegitimize the weaponization of anti-Semitism because it's also important that, you know, in, the, the thing that's, th this, this weaponization of anti-Semitism primarily is dangerous for Palestinians and Muslims who speak out because it's used to demonize people. Um, just criticizing Israel based on facts, um, you know, are called uh, anti-Semitic. Um, and, and this is used to shut down conversation um, and, and in some places like Germany even used to legally persecute people. Um, at the same time, this also in some ways puts Jews in danger because it's, it's making the entire, it's, 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 it's removing meaning from the term anti-Semitism even. Like if, if anti-Semitism is just saying facts about Israel, then it's, it's easy to make actual hatred or violence against Jewish people sound like it's not a real thing. So, um, so I, it's, it, it, that weaponization is upsetting to me for both of those reasons. Um, but in, in terms of how you can deal with the gaslighting, um, I mean, I think, uh, unfortunately, I think you just have to be able to, uh, you know, clearly articulate where you're, where you're coming from and why um, what you're saying is based on actual facts. But, you know, unfortunately, um, if, if, if people are going to accuse you of things, like I, yeah, I, <laughs> it's hard, it's very hard because this term is, is so charged um, in our societies because of the history of European anti-Semitism and then it's being weaponized into uh, promoting the persecution of another people. So I think, I think it's very challenging. I, I applaud you for, um, for your activism and for trying to speak out. Um, and I would just say that, you know, I, I hope you know that there are Jewish people who are with you, which is also part of why we, we made this film. Yeah, really great questions. Um, you know, as, as Sam talked, I think it's really important for us to actually have conversations about defining anti-Semitism, what anti-Semitism actually is. Um, again, there's a long history of anti-Semitism, again, which is primarily about conspiracy theories of Jews, of claiming that Jews have power that they do not, or that they are controlling things they do, that they do not. And we've seen that, obviously, that's what led to the Holocaust. Israel is a country, and it's doing real things. Um, and when I talk about those real things, right, I'm obviously not being anti-Semitic. When I talk about real things America has done, am I being anti-American, or am I just being honest about the brutal history of America, or Britain, 
or Canada, or virtually every... Or the Netherlands. Yeah. Don't no, oh, the forget. Netherlands, yeah. Belgium and the Netherlands, mm -hmm. we, we didn't They're forget about you guys, too. They're very good at PR, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And again, so all, you know, I think, so again, really also pushing people to really define what anti-Semitism is, I think, is critically important. And again, as Sam mentioned, it's incredibly tragic because anti-Semitism is real, as we talked about. Neo-Nazism is alive is alive and well in America. It's certainly alive and well in Germany. Um, Geert, you know, Wilders, obviously, is, you know, is, is horrible. Um, and again, you have Benjamin Netanyahu posing for photo ops with him. Um, again, you know, cozying up to people who do not care about minority rights simply because they quote unquote support Israel. Uh, and that's actually, I think, incredibly dangerous to Jewish people, um, that alliance between pro-Israel voices and far-right voices. Um, to get to the next question, um, well, I, I'll do the third question first really quickly. There is stuff being done on American college campuses, not nearly enough, um, but there have been some successful divestment campaigns, um, divesting either from Israel as a whole or from weapons manufacturers. Um, not nearly enough, um, there's obviously a lot of pushback. Um, but also, again, for the first time, we are seeing massive numbers of major American cities uh, legislatively call for a ceasefire. Chicago, San Francisco, major American cities have voted for a ceasefire. Hawaii is likely going to be the first state to call for a ceasefire. Um, a large majority of Americans, um, Jewish, Muslim, et cetera, support a ceasefire. So it is happening. It's happening far too slowly um, because Joe Biden is, is a strong supporter of Israel, tragically. Um, but, but things are, are happening. Um, and when, uh, to get to the second question about screenings in Israel, we were actually planning a, a big Israel-Palestine screening tour. We were planning it in September. October 7th happened. Um, it's important to note, again, our team is made up of both American Jews, Israelis, and Palestinians. What's happening in Gaza is clearly genocidal. Um, but also, again, the victims of October 7th were real people. They had precious lives. I know people whose parents were killed by Hamas on October 7th, and their lives are just as precious as anybody else's. Um, so we, we, we are going to screen in Israel at some point, um, probably with Breaking the Silence and other other groups that we show in the film. That being said, I have much more hope in American Jews to change than Israeli Jews to change. Uh, American Jews are incredibly liberal, are very left-wing. Um, they often support Israel largely because we've been told that Israel is also left-wing. We hear growing up that Israel is this beacon of democracy, beacon of queer rights, beacon of basically, you know, of, of, of liberal kind of attitudes in the Middle East. Um, and the reason why so many of us change is we realize that it's not. We realize that actually Israel is not aligned with our values and we stick with our values over nationalism. Um, whereas Isra Israeli society is incredibly right wing. Um, again, uh, you know, 50% of American Jews want a ceasefire. A massive majority of Israelis in the recent polls I've seen think that not enough destruction has been wrought in Gaza. Um, I mean, it is, it is horrifying. And again, they grew up in a very nationalistic, incredibly isolated um, society where they don't get a lot of news sources. It doesn't justify what's happening, but I think, and that's why I, I think, you know, internal change is gonna be extremely difficult. And just like with South Africa, it had to come from both inside as well as outside. And so we, what we see our job as being mostly is to help diaspora Jews around the world, both in America and in Europe, um, strongly say not in our name and strongly say we are Jewish and we are fighting for Palestinian rights because we are Jewish. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, I'll take the, la the, the two next questions and uh, then we will let the others join uh, so we can move on. Uh, I don't know who was here. I had two people here, if you still wanna ask. Yeah. There were three? There were two, so we're just gonna take two for now. No, no, but I thought there were three speakers, so if there are only two, then we'll just do you two. Okay, so these two people in front. Uh, yeah, the, the three ones. I'm not taking any more if you were not in line. Because we're out of time and I have a plan and I'm the one here, so is that okay with you? There's sir? other panelists who are going to be so joining much. us. Uh, we'll just well. take you three then. Yes, the yep. ones that were already here. Great, let's do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I'll uh, speak uh, quickly, but just I just, um, uh, before I ask the question, one heartfelt thank you. I'm not a Jew, but I work as a legal scholar at the University, the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam, and I have experienced myself how difficult it is and how big the pushback is from the institution once you speak up. And it's really such a valuable organizing tool to be able to share. So thank you. Um, and my question is, and it's actually, I think it's on the verge of being ridiculous, but just further to what you just commented on, things are changing and Joe Biden, I think, is slowly being pushed by, I think, by parts of the electorate actually to, to a changing course. I'm just wondering, I think uh, the majority of people who came here are just sick to their stomachs seeing what's happening still. Indeed, um, of course, also fully acknowledging uh, the atrocities that happened on October 7th, but just the continuation of this is just 
a horror scenario. I was wondering what uh, the question, if there's anything you could say, what do you expect is the outlook in Gaza and on the West Bank? Thank you. Hi. Um, so a lot of the movie, as I see it, is around, around identity, how you build identity and how you, you deconstruct it. And I'm, I'm an Israeli, and as, as I see American Jews, at some point they can redraw from Israel and Zionism and be American. And did you go, did you deal through making the movie about the journey or the questions that Israelis, uh, Jews, Israeli Jews, that see themselves still live in Israel in the future, to what identity they think when they want to oppose the occupation, to what identity they can withdraw, because it's not just about the West Bank, it's about 48, and we all know that. And this identity question, yeah, it, did you deal with it during making the movie? Hi. I I have just a short question about uh, screening. Um, is it possible to screen it somewhere else in the Netherlands? And did you try to go to the ITVA or other things? Um, I work at a school of journalism and I would love to show it there. So, um, well, maybe we should talk about it. Thank you so much. So. Okay, so um, first question was about what will happen in terms of um, Gaza and will we get a ceasefire and what will America do? I obviously don't have all the answers, um, but I'll try to talk a little bit about what I think is happening in American politics, um, which is that as you alluded to, um, Biden is getting a lot of pressure from um, the base of the Democratic Party is very unhappy with, with and is also sick to our stomachs with, with what is happening in Gaza right now. Um, I think that, and, and there's a recent poll that showed just how much the electorate has shifted. I think, you know, as of November, when October 7th was still fresh and the death toll was lower, um, a majority of American voters approved of what Israel was doing. I, I, I certainly did not, but a majority of American voters approved of what Israel was doing. That is not the case at all anymore. A very significant majority um, of Americans are uh, upset about what is happening in Gaza. So, um, and, and much, especially Democrats, especially you know many of the people who are the most activist within the liberal side of the party and therefore the people who are doing the grassroots, you know, get out the vote efforts. Um, so Biden really, need, you know, some peripheral people say, well, this is only a minority of people or a small minority of people will actually vote on the basis of Gaza, especially when the alternative is, is Donald Trump, who is a fascist. Um, but you need the, the people who are, you know, Democratic Party activists to actually go out and do turnout operations and mobilize people and stuff. And those people are really, uh, really feeling saddened and, and having a real, real trouble being motivated to do anything um, for Biden or the Democrats right now. And this is a problem that they know they have. Um, but they're also trying to not upset APAC and um, the pros real lobby, which also has a ton of power, uh, has a ton of money. Um, unfortunately, in American politics, money is 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 uh, much more effective than it is, I'm told, in in European politics. Um, our elections cost literally billions of dollars. It's insane. Um, so I think Biden is really Biden. I think the White House really wants to see a ceasefire and a hostage deal. Um, and obviously, like you know, we're often told a cease. You know, how can you call for a ceasefire without? Uh, the release of the hostages, well, how are you going to get the hostages back without a, a ceasefire? Um, you know, the Israeli military has probably killed more hostages, significantly more hostages than it has freed um, in, in its horrific military operation in Gaza. So um, I think that there will be growing pressure um, on Netanyahu from Biden. Biden has been really trying to, it, it seems like trying to slow down or stop the invasion of Rafah. Um, which seems to be potentially imminent. 
Biden has been, you know, doing these kind of ridiculous and in some ways performative things like airdropping aid, which is totally inefficient and actually has killed some people, um, as opposed to, you know, just demanding that the Israelis let more trucks through, um, which is the best way of getting aid to people. And, um, you know, we, we still keep sending them the bombs. And that that is what we have to ultimately like the only thing that that Netanyahu will listen to is if we stop sending the bombs and the jet fuel, because, um, you know, he basically, I think, knows that uh, it, as soon as the war ends, he is there is a good chance he will be out and will go to prison. And it's not that the Israeli politics will be great after Netanyahu. Um, unfortunately, as we've talked about, Israeli politics o across the spectrum is quite right wing. But uh, Netanyahu is, is is really clinging to power um, because Israelis also know that it, he really messed up by allowing October seventh to happen. Obviously. Um, so I think we will continue to see growing conflict between Netanyahu and Biden. I don't, I don't know how it will play out, but I am hopeful that um, that America will not be able to continue its blanket support of Israel anymore. We saw this with the UN ceasefire thing, although then they're kind of walking it back. It's very disgusting how slow it is taking, but I, I do think that um, it will be impossible for the Democrats to keep supporting um, what Israel is doing at this point. Uh, is, is it okay we move on to the next question? Yes, yeah, just, still, just because I'll, otherwise I'll we won't have time for the of rest course. of the panelists. No, and the second course. question was yes. about... I got them both. Got so there was one by this really great um, Israeli guy. And yeah, it's a really, really uh, great question. And I think it's important to note um, that it is, of course, easier for American Jews um, to criticize Israel because it's not our entire identity. Um, if you're an Israeli, obviously, you live in Israel. I think it's important to note, too, that when we talk about the horrible things Israel has done, Israel is not unique in doing horrible things. America has done far worse historically. We committed genocide on a massive continental scale and had a settler colonial state that took over an entire continent and enslaved people for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but why I think it's important to talk about that is all we are asking Israelis to do is to look honestly at their history. Just like as Americans, all we're asking of our fellow Americans is to look honestly at our history. And Americans, right, have figured out a way to both be, exist, and be honest about our history. Not all of us, obviously. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump and, and many others want to totally ignore the genocide that, was, um, that, that, that our country was founded upon, but it's possible to simply be honest about your history and try to figure out ways to move on. Um, and that's all we're asking Israelis to do. We're not asking Israelis to hate themselves. We're not asking Israelis, again, to necessarily to leave. Again, they deserve to live there like anybody else. Jews have always lived in Palestine. We originated there. We had kingdoms there. We just don't think it's acceptable to have a Jewish supremacist state that's created at the expense of another people. Um, so again, just like as Americans, there are ways to be an American and fully comprehend and try to come to terms with the genocide of Native Americans and the unbelievable history of slavery. Israelis have to figure out a way to do that too. They have to come to terms with the fact that although, again, the world abandoned them, the world abandoned the Jewish people in a profound way, what happened afterwards was we transferred that trauma onto another people. Um, we took their land and we kicked them out of their homes. And we have to figure out a way to actually accept that and understand that and try to move on through justice, through reparation, through the right of return. But until we do that, um, it's going to be very hard. Um, so again, but in America, many people have done it, right? We are fully, there's many people on the left who fully understand that we are a genocidal nation. We were founded on a genocide, on ethnic cleansing, and are trying to make it right, are trying to make up for it and move on and try to make something out of that impossible situation. Um, so Israelis are not unique. Again, Australia, what Australia did, what Canada did, what America did was worse than what Israel has done. It just happened 100 years earlier. Um, so we just have to be honest about our history. And lastly, um, yeah, so anybody can watch the film for $5 on our website. Almost all of our screenings are free, um, but anybody can watch it at any point for $5. You can show it anywhere you want. Um, we have like our official tour um, where you have to go through a process because we, we go to all of our screenings. Um, but anybody can watch it anytime they want. You can project it for your classes, anything you want. We're a nonprofit. We want people to watch the film. Um, so please spread the word about the film. Um, watch it. And yeah, um, thank you. A round of applause for Sam and thank Aaron, you. everybody. Thank you. thank you so much. Okay, we're trying to readjust here a little bit. Um, okay. You have the mics and everything? 
Okay, so now we are going to uh, be joined by uh, three wonderful uh, individuals who are doing amazing work in different types of Jewish organizations. Um, Erla cannot be here in person because uh, she is ill at the moment, but she will be joining us uh, on the screen. Aha, here we go. Welcome, Erla. Um, so maybe we could start very quickly with having you guys introduce yourselves, Jonathan, Levi, Erla, and uh, yeah, wh why are you here? Hello, uh, is it on? Yes. Okay, good. good. So my name is uh, Jonathan Buskila Lestek. Uh, I'm a member of OIVE, which is a progressive, I guess, messy Jewish organization here in the Netherlands that tries to reclaim Jewish life in Europe, something uh, make Jewish existence possible and alive, and I'll keep it short with that. Thank you. Hello, oh, it, it works. Uh, hello, I'm Levi Hills. Um, I'm with Erev Raf, also with Joanna. Um, and we are a anti-Zionist Jewish collective. And I think we kind of started to exib exist because the Jewish voices weren't being heard that actually uh, are anti-Zionist, so we felt that we were necessary to be part of the conversation. Erela? Hi, good evening, and thanks for having me uh, on Zoom. Um, so, uh, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Gate48, which is a platform for critical Israelis uh, in the Netherlands. We uh, were founded uh, 15 years ago. We kind of thought maybe we wouldn't have that much work to do, but of course, there is a lot to do, and uh, basically we want to uh, kind of uh, influence and change the, 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 the debate uh, within the Netherlands. That's how we started, um, by, um, by inviting and, and, and uh, critical uh, voices from, from Israel and Palestine, from grassroots organizations, activists, um, and bring these voices to, uh, to the Netherlands. Thank you, Echela. Maybe we can start with sharing initial thoughts. I'm really interested in hearing what you guys thought. What are the parallel similarities that you see between the movie and the Dutch context and, of course, within your work? Well, <clears throat> uh, well, there was a lot I already knew, um, but I have never been part of a community where um, Israelism was promoted, thankfully. Um, so for me, this was an experience I have never lived, um, but I know people live through this and um, it's still shocking to see that this is actually happening and it's still happening and people are actually being made into murder machines um, and they think it's a good thing. Um, I uh, cried a few times, um, also because I felt some, uh, still like a little shame there uh, even though I know I'm not like that, and I know a lot of people aren't like that, but I know it's uh, it's terrible. So yes, I, I I was hurt to see the the movie, but I'm also very thankful that it's been made because it's really important that everyone sees this. Aaron and Sam, is this something that you that you hear often from Jewish people that they saw the movie and they felt a deep feeling of, of shame and comfortability, even though they are aware of, of the things of the movie? Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, obviously, one thing that we're trying to do is separate Judaism from Zionism, right? Judaism is an ancient religion and ancient culture. Zionism is a relatively new political movement, and but many in the U.S. and, and many larger um, kind of pro-Israel orgs try to make it seem like they're the same. Um, and so, you know, I, but I, I think because of that and because our community has been very complicit, um, it is very, it, 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 it hurts, it, it does hurt. I mean, you know, I, I'm related by marriage to the Prime Minister of Israel that began the occupation, Levi Eshkol, in the 1967 war. And it's, you know, thinking about the fact that my, my family hung out with him in the 60s and had a great time and basically partied with him um, while the military occupation uh, in the West Bank was beginning is, is hard to, to think about and, and to comprehend. So I do understand that it's obviously not our fault, um, but, you know, our, our communities have been complicit in many ways, and it's, it's hard to, to fathom. Jonathan, that's do why you have... Good. That's why this is a good thing, because I felt shame, but it's the, the uncomfortable thing that is a good thing, even though I feel like I don't have any connection to Israel, thankfully. Um, but it's good that we feel this uncomfortable feeling. That's yeah. what moves people. Jonathan, do you have any initial thoughts? How did it feel to see the movie... Uh, any similarities, parallels? So I think I have two small points. I think one thing that really brought 
me to attention was the fact how the choice of the platform for Jewish voices is given. So despite a plurality, despite diversity, there is an option to seek that uniformity and to have leaders who speak in that single voice rather than give the microphone to actual Jewish people to talk and show themselves and show the diversity. And I think that's, uh, that's something that re really resonates with the conversation here a lot of the time. And I think perhaps not disconnected to that is the fragility of that choice. Because one thing that struck me is that, you know, once someone like Simone shows up and the whole thing goes down the drain, the alarm. So it shows how fragile it is that a, that a person, a, something that they, they say is small, and try to undermine, threatens them to a, that big, you know, the monopoly of the voice. So they only have the monopoly of the voice because they have to constantly silence voices. And it becomes very clear in that movement of monopolizing that they have to silence. And in monopolizing, they make their, their position fragile because the, in order for it to be the single voice, they have to very clearly undermine other voices repeatedly again and again and again. So that was something that became very evident for me in the book and I think resonates with the experience here and elsewhere. Yeah, and I think also uh, you showed very well in the movie that dehumanization that activists, organizers, Jews that are anti-Zionist, progressive, critical of Israel experience and that is also um, a sort of biopolitical control when one of you uh, steps out of the company line, they will be punished and you will know about it. So it warns all the others not to speak out. So, that, so that's uh, also a very striking pa parallel. Erela, how, how is it for you? Um, parallel similarities, what were your impressions of the movie? Um, yeah, briefly about uh, similarity. So I'm yeah, also not, not from, from, uh, from a like, traditional Jewish uh, Dutch community. Um, um, but uh, what I do see, I think, I think there are a lot of parallels in the discourse. I think the discourse in the Netherlands, uh, if you're looking for um, similarities, is, uh, is, is of course very Zionist and very pro-Israel. Also, uh, as was said before, uh, kind of in the, the idea that we're kind of leftist, you know, we're not really rightist. We, we know that there, uh, th there is an occupation, of course, we're against occupation. Uh, and, you know, it was even said by, I think, um, a majority of the Jewish community. Um, so it's, that's quite similar. I think the big difference is that the Jewish community, of course, in, in the Netherlands is so much smaller. So the organization of the Asbara, like, you know, as it is in the United States, it's, it's, it's much less organized. I mean, there is, of course, an effort to organize it as such. Um, but uh, the scale is, uh, is really, is really uh, different. But I think that uh, many people from the, from the uh, community would, um, would recognize uh, things and what for me was uh, I think one of the most important things about the film um, is that it's uh, really about transformations, right? About 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 the transformation people can go through, and I think it's really important to take that into account that this happens and that th these are processes. These are these are processes that take sometimes years, right? Coming from a very Zionist home to understanding what's going on, learning, hearing, you know, dealing with it emotionally. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that was one of the things that I found uh, really important uh, in the film and, and to recognize that these transformations take place. Also for others outside of the community, because many people now, um, I think also in a pro-Palestinian, pro I don't like the pro-pro-pro-anti pro kind of uh, dichotomy, um, group th it's kind of sometimes people, I have the idea that people think that, you know, transformations are not possible. So, you know, people ha that have been, you know, in, in the military, um, they're really delegitimized. And you see it with breaking the silence, for example, you know, um, yeah, they're not proud of their past uh, and, and, and something is possible afterwards. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, That's you made the perfect bridge to what I wanted to talk about next. And that is acknowledging that there are even different levels of unlearning in this room uh, because we come from different organizations, different collectives with different goals. Um, so steering the conversation a little bit into that direction, how do we make space for each other when we are all at different levels of unlearning? And I think it's, it, it, we need to also uh, be realistic when having this discussion because um, Yes, ide ideologically similarity and purity uh, can be great, and it's it's amazing to work with people that see eye to eye to you. But one of the reasons why we also wanted to keep this moment open is because we see that um, there's also a lot of internal politics at play in our organizing. So um, 
what are the different levels of unlearning in this room? For example, Levi, you, you've, you've explained that uh, for you, you didn't really grow up with the indoctrination. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so maybe I need a little bit of my background for that. Um, my family um, was also killed in Auschwitz. Uh, and my grandfather, he became orphaned, so he kind of lost his religion there. Um, but we still wanted to keep the cultural stuff, but we never really felt like we had to go to a, a quote-unquote safe place um, to survive because I think my mother has always told me we need to go to the root of the problem and we don't need to move to another island where it's supposed to be safe. No, it should be safe where you already are, uh, so we have to fight for that. So that's actually why my, my mother was always against uh, Israel. Uh, and she was always pro-Palestinian, um, and she was always for the freedom of Palestinians, so I was always taught that that was uh, something not to do. <laughs> yeah, and, and me similarly, I also didn't grow up in a Zionist household, so the work that you know, I had to do in terms of unlearning, it was dramatically different than somebody that, that had grew up. Um, how about for you, Erela? How, how do you, would you describe your unlearning process. Can you share with us a little bit about that? Um, yes, I can. So I am. I'm, I come from a, from an Israeli uh, home, but I've been in the Netherlands for for a long time, and I come from a home that's really uh, kind of yeah classic uh, Zionist, but very much not religious. From a Shomer, uh, Shomer Tzair, very non-religious uh, Jewish uh, movement. Um, so when when growing up further, like so you, you know, so Zionism is is there, and but it's also unspoken of. It's not like you know we we see in the film that it has to be you know this connection has to be made all the time with Israel because you know it's there. You're in Israel. It's 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 just you know like the air you breathe, um, uh, so natural. So um, um, so that's that's one thing. And in my growing up, uh, also largely in the Netherlands, um, I was also happy, and I think maybe <laughs> we have that in common uh, to be growing up with a very critical mother. Um, who uh, took me to uh, you know many demonstrations, not only about Israel Palestine, but uh, also another another instances. So, learn, so, so taught me to to think and uh, to, to think and ask questions. And I think also as an anthropologist, um, this is from a very you know from early in my career in my in my studies. Uh, this is what I started to do. My my research is is uh, completely in uh, taking place in Israel uh, on the militarism and on the, on the military. So this is from very kind of as a as a young scholar, I started asking critical questions as we do as anthropologists about, you know, about this influence of the military, for example, on society. What does it mean? What does militarism mean? Um, and uh, what's happening? Uh, what are we doing uh, in occupied territories, etc.? cetera? So, uh, so, so that kind of came together for me with asking these questions. Um, and then, uh, so then this process uh, started. And, you know, over the years, uh, you learn and you learn and you cannot, un I think, once you know, you cannot not know, unknow, you cannot go back. Um, and um, yeah, so that's kind of the the process uh, of, um, of of kind of really of really also being confident in in uh, in my position. And I see that as a difference with many young people who are still kind of, you know, in this process of unlearning. Um, and i I also try to kind of help help them and is saying, you know, you know, it, it takes time. It's okay. It's okay to, you know, to doubt and to be uns unsure of yourself and to feel guilt. Um, um, but uh, at, at some point you will, you know, with knowing more, you will be more confident in, in, in your beliefs. Thank you, Erela. Jonathan, um, levels of unlearning. So it's a long story, but I was born in Brazil to an Israeli Moroccan family. The reason why we end up in Brazil is because Moroccans were not very welcome in the first, so we talk about Palestinian and I don't want to stick to spotlight, but Ella Schwartz's text, I highly recommend Zionism from uh, its, the, its Jewish victims, tells the story of the Arab Jews who showed up there and what happened to them. So my grandpa landed in the Levant, the Holy Land, and very clearly realized that he was not very welcome and went to Brazil. Uh, we grew up, so we grew up with that story of how Zionism uh, was not very welcoming to us. Uh, so that started very early. Uh, but we also also lived between Brazil and Israel. Uh, I refused to do the army when I was 18, very early, and I joined Combatants for Peace. I don't think you talk to anyone from Combatants for Peace. Um, and I think a very good, again, an, another odd to motherhood when I would tell my mother about 
my issues with Israel, she would say, why are you lecturing me? I voted for Shulamit Aloni. Shulamit Aloni, for those who don't know, is the mother of Udi Aloni, the, the big activist, a, a left-wing radical. So my mother would say to me, how dare you lecture me? I voted for Shulamit Aloni. And that was my upbringing, I guess. Um, we are reaching the end. Um, any closing remarks, Aaron and Sam, before you leave us to go to France? Where is your next screening, I believe? Yeah, so we ha we're doing Paris uh, on Monday, and then we're doing two screenings. Uh, we're doing it with Sedek, it's, it's a progressive Jewish group there, and then we're doing two screenings uh, with Naamod in uh, the UK. Uh, we're also doing a couple other screenings in Manchester and Bristol, I think. Uh, and yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Again, hopefully what our film can show too is that we must fight anti-Semitism, but we must also fight for Palestinian freedom and that you can do both, actually very easily. Um, it's not that hard to do both. And that's, that's kind of, you know, that's where, that's where we landed up as Jewish activists. And again, I'm really grateful um, to you and to so many um, other folks who you know, really helped organize this event. And thank you so much again. Sam, any last words or if you're good? Okay, um, before we leave, I just want to give the chance to the organizations that are present here because I guess where we would like to end is what can you do about this and where do you now go with this information? Uh, so we're going to do a one minute speed round in which everybody just gets to say where they can find them. Uh, Liva and I are here from Erev Rav. You can find us on Instagram. Um, we have a couple of upcoming events. We have a Passover Seder in April. Uh, tomorrow we're present at an international anti-Zionist meeting in Paris to talk about the decolonization of anti-Semitism here in the Netherlands. Uh, tomorrow there is a protest in the Dam. Unfortunately, we cannot be there, but we recommend that you go. Um, it's it's uh, our allies and networks of solidarity are going to be present there. Um, so yeah, if you want to talk to us, this is where you, you can find us. Uh, Erela, do you want to say a little bit about Get48? What have you guys been up to? Where can people find you? Um, yeah, so we've been quite active lately also with like op-eds, etc. Uh, you can find uh, most of it on our website, we're old school, um, gate48.org. Uh, we also have Instagram and Facebook. Uh, find us there so uh, we, we update that uh, and most importantly well, I mean we do a lot of ad, ad hoc things such as you know at uh, Bali with the film festival it was supported by the Israeli embassy and uh, we, uh, we we wrote a letter about that uh, and uh, on every Sunday we have a protest it's a weekly on, on five o'clock on the SPAU uh, so uh, everyone's welcome uh, to join us there and that's also in cooperation with uh, with uh, the yeah, the diaspora action groups, so, so uh, Israeli, uh, critical Israeli groups uh, all around the world uh, who also organize um, you know, protests um, together. Thank you, Echela. Uh, Jonathan? So also Instagram, I'm not on social media, but I know there is a, a, a Instagram by Oive. You, if you look it up, you can find it. Uh, there's a website. I think the upcoming events, we have the Shabbat, dinner, we have a Pesach, and sometimes I have to self-advertise. There is a reading group of radical Jewish texts. I coordinated it, so I have to advertise it. It's called Divin Teshiva. It's not running now, but it's going to start running, and I highly recommend attending. And uh, if I could just plug the, our film's website for a yes, quick please. second, because um, Aaron referred to it before, so it's IsraelismFilm.com um, is where you can go. You can uh, rent the movie there. You can also uh, see all of our tour dates coming up um, and then um, and, and ticket information and stuff. And then we're at Israelism Film on all the social media, Instagram, TikTok, until America maybe bans it, um, you, uh, Facebook, Twitter, etc. So, yes. Thank you so much again, y'all. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for coming, and of course, thank you to Packhouse Speicher for having us here a little bit uh, after closing time. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you next time.